When we have a distribution of scale level scores, continuous data, there are four questions that we have about our distribution. The first two being the middle, where is the middle of the distribution? The second being how spread out or close together are the scores in that distribution? These are measures of central tendency and variability, center and spread. To answer these two questions, I should begin by defining what I mean by central tendency and variability and explaining how these two qualities of a distribution work together. Let's start by defining central tendency. Central tendency is where the center of the distribution tends to be. The measure of central tendency answers the question of whether the scores are generally high or generally low. Let's imagine that we are measuring average heights for specific groups. We could measure the heights of all college students enrolled at our university. But there are subgroups within that larger group of individuals that might have generally higher or generally lower scores. For instance, if we were to get the average height of the basketball team, do you think that it would be the same as a typical college student? Probably not. Because we know that basketball players tend to be taller than average. We might find that the average height of basketball players at our university is six foot four. They are generally taller. Now, anytime I offer a generality about any group, like uh, basketball players tend to be taller than average, someone might reply, well, that's not true because I know a basketball player who is five foot six. Now, while it is true that you can find basketball players whose height is below the average, that is arguing from an outlier. When I talk about averages, I'm talking about the entire group and what is typical about that group. So yes, there may be people who are exceptionally tall or very short, and they may all play basketball. However, when we consider everyone together as a group, that entire group has an average height of six foot four, for example. On the other hand, there are other groups whose measure of central tendency is generally low. So by contrast to basketball players, if we were looking at the average height of horse jockeys, we would find that their average height is less than what is typical for American males. Their measure of central tendency is generally low. But central tendency is just one of the four questions that we want to ask about our distribution. The second is about variability, or said a different way, about the consistency of the scores. What we find among our basketball players is they are consistently tall. What we find among our horse jockeys, they are consistently shorter. But what about other distributions? It turns out that there can be great variability within a distribution, and that's going to affect the way that we went, would interpret the average. Let me define variability. Variability indicates how spread out or how close together the scores are in our distribution. By contrast, we could talk about consistency. This is the way that we might describe variability in everyday life. So when there are large differences among scores, the data are said to contain a lot of variability. Let me talk a little bit more about variability in the real world. In life, we tend to prefer low variability and high consistency. And part of the reason for that preference is that when scores are consistent, they tell us more about the thing that we are interested in. Let me illustrate this. I went out to breakfast one morning and I found on the menu for three egg omelets, I could order two sides, but those sides added between 10 and 1,680 calories to the meal. That's a lot of variability for two sides. I want to know which sides have more or fewer calories. I could use my measure of central tendency to say that vegetables tend to have lower levels of calories and fried foods tend to have higher levels of calories. 
But when I'm measuring all of the sides together, there's so much variability that it's really difficult for me to know what side contains what number of calories. Here's another example of variability in the real world. I want you to imagine that we're going on a road trip. We're going to travel from Springfield, Missouri to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that is going to take us across the Will Rogers Turnpike. As we travel across this Oklahoma Turnpike, we're going to pass underneath what was once billed as the world's largest McDonald's. Turns out that the actual McDonald's inside of the building is the same size as you're familiar with in most restaurants, although the building itself does span quite a distance. In fact, what we're going to do is stop at every McDonald's that we pass on our road trip. And my question is, what would you expect in the taste of the burgers as we stop at every subsequent McDonald's? Will the variability be high or low? The variability will be low. The taste of the burgers will be very consistent. If you've eaten at many McDonald's at all, you know that every McDonald's burger tastes pretty much like every other McDonald's burger. And that is a feature, not a bug. We like consistency in the real world. And so restaurants know that if they offer a consistent product, we will know what to expect and we will be able to make choices about what foods we want to eat. Notice I'm not saying anything about central tendency, whether the meals tend to be excellent or not very good. Let's assume that you really love the taste of McDonald's burgers. You think that the average burger is very good. Well, you will be very pleased because there will be a consistent flavor regardless of which McDonald's you go to. On the other hand, maybe you know another restaurant that you think is excellent. Again, variability matters. If you go to that restaurant the first time and have an excellent meal, you might want to go back again. But if you go back the second time and there is high variability at that restaurant, in other words, the second meal is not nearly as good as the first, you might be really skeptical about going back a third time. But let's say that you were assigned to go back five or ten times. Maybe we're going to pay for your meal. You just keep track of how much you enjoyed the meal. If the variability is high, if sometimes the meals are great and sometimes they're awful, this is probably not a restaurant that you're going to want to return to because you never know on any particular trip whether it's going to be good or not. We prefer consistency, low variability, because that also leads to high predictability. We know what we're going to get. And that is the benefit of using central tendency and variability together. The greater the variability, the less accurately the data are summarized by the measure of central tendency. When variability is high, we have low predictability. We are going to measure variability using standard deviation, something that I will teach you more about coming up soon. In these two examples, the average score, the mean, is exactly the same. But in the distribution with high variability, Scores may be close to the mean, or they may be much higher or much lower than the mean. This would be analogous to that restaurant, where sometimes the meals are exceptionally good, sometimes they're not very good, sometimes they're just mediocre. On the other hand, with a small standard deviation, all of the scores in the distribution are very close to the mean. They are all very consistent. In these two distributions with the same mean but different variability, we have high or low measures of predictability. When a restaurant is consistent, you always know what you're going to get. They're always going to be serving meals that are very similar to each other. In a restaurant with high variability, the meals could be great or bad, and you won't know which one you're going to get. You can never predict. We use the mean and the standard deviation, the central tendency and the variability together. The variability tells us how much we can trust our measure of central tendency.